Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, David, and good afternoon, most of all, students. Um, Shall we start off, uh, if you could just go around, make sure the mic's working. We'll introduce ourselves, shall we, one by one. If you could just say your name, what school you're from, and uh, what you're studying, that would be a great start. I'm Jacob Lloyd. I'm at, from Archbishop Holgate's school, and I'm studying uh, double engineering, B-Tech, maths, physics, and chemistry. Hello, my name is Faisal Kishtani, uh, a student from Archbishop Holgate, studying maths, physics, and double engineering, B-Tech. I'm Peter Lang. I'm a computing student, art and design, enterprise and game development at the Studio School Liverpool. Um, I'm Adam Galloway from the Studio Liverpool, and in addition to my normal GCSEs, I'm doing computer science and creative media and business. I'm Ali Balak um, from the Liverpool Life Sciences UCC, and I'm studying biology, psychology, maths, and applied science. Um, I'm Chloe O'Rourke. I go to Liverpool Life Sciences UTC Liverpool. Um, I study physics, chemistry, biology, and maths. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome. Um, I'm going to start with you over there because the mics are over there, so that's impractical. Um, <coughs> Chloe, you were speaking earlier about um, bioinformatics. This is a word that I didn't know um, before I spoke to you. Um, so perhaps you could explain to the audience a bit about some of the things you're doing with bioinformatics. Right, that's great. Um, okay, so our college basically works in partnership with a, um, an amazing guy called uh, Professor Hornby. Um, and he works in Sheffield and he's, he's so generous and shares a lot of his time with us and works on bioinformatics. Now what we do is we take proteins and we study them. Uh, we learn what they're made out of, so amino acids, and how to code them, how to study them, and the difference between them. For example, recently we're studying a gene called FOXP2. And this is a gene which is responsible for muscles around your mouth. Now, using a blast search, you compare this to uh, chimpanzees, our closest ancestors. Um, and this um, chain of amino acids, which chimpanzees don't have, actually allows humans to be able to speak with the fine tuning of their muscles around their mouth. Um, and this kind of interesting area is what we go into, including things with, um, um, we're currently doing fluorescence and um, inserting this into E. coli and growing um, fluorescent bacteria um, and learning how to do that and all the skills that go along with it. And it's just amazing, it truly is amazing. That does sound pretty amazing. Um, too many just to check, we're not going to have any talking chimpanzees to come around today. Yeah. Fine. Um, but you, you spoke a little bit about fluorescence as well. And Ali, were you doing any of the work with um, yeah, fluorescence? I mean, uh, um, we have different um, project-based learning classes. So um, occasionally we do, we do different um, topics um, depending on who we have. So, um, but we, we, we did work um, pretty much on the same lines of what Chloe did as well. Fantastic. That's awesome. We'll be returning to you. Um, uh, Adam. Uh, you, you're at the studio, and um, I, I had a little browse of your website, and I, I played a couple of the games. You create games, is that right? Yeah. Computer games. I played a couple of the games, and I wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> but maybe you could explain a little bit about that. I think the game I played was um, uh, Late for a Date, is what I played. Um, yeah. and, and I kept falling down holes, so I think I lost. Um, <laughs> but maybe you could tell a bit about how kind of this, this game design works, and, and kind of how, because you're particularly involved with, with designing games, aren't you? Yeah, um, essentially for project-based learning, we're placed into groups of um, like a, a, up to eight people, I think it is, and made, that comprises of uh, people who are into marketing, people who are into coding, and people who are into, um, you know, uh, artists, you know, art and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and essentially you're given a set time and a brief, and you've got to make a game that's, um, that lives up to that brief. And right now we're making Peggy 7 games, and we're working with industry mentors to make you, them. You're going to have to enlighten well. me, Adam. What is a Peggy 7 game? Um, essentially, that means that it's playable by anyone above, um, yeah, above the age of 7. Oh, right, OK. I, was, I thought it was technical language there. But <laughs> I, was, I think I've got that. Um, so, Jacob, I know you, you have a lot of um, opportunities to work with outside agencies, and Ad, Adam was speaking a bit about that there. Um, what kind of things are you able to do? Um, we're able to, they come in quite frequently, the um, companies from around the area, and we're located in the Baltic Triangle, which is like a hub for creative and digital companies, um, and we're in the heart of it. So, companies are able to come in, do workshops and masterclasses, and sort of guide us through the development of our game. 
And we've also had, you know, like work experience at, at their companies and done different things with them. And just generally mentor us how to be ready for industry. Great. And is that just built into normal curriculum time? Where do you find the time to do all this amazing stuff? Um, we're on, generally on a Thursday and Friday, we are given set times, like set lessons, um, where we're allowed to develop these games and have these workshops. And um, we've got like um, a lecture theatre in the school itself. So we're a, the companies are able to come in and present easily and like launch some of their own games or apps. So it's really... Um, a great opportunity. Yeah, you sound like you're, you're grasping <laughs> it as well, you're not letting yeah. it pass you by. Yeah, because I've had um, several like work placements um, from around the Baltic Triangle. At, like, um, I'm currently at Citrus Suite, a mobile app development company, and they're absolutely um, brilliant. And they sort of give you really good tasks to do. They like give you real life things to work on, and it actually helps, and you feel ready for industry. Fantastic, that sounds really exciting. Um, Faisal, I, we were speaking earlier over some lunch, and uh, you, you mentioned that you, you're in engineering is what you're interested in, yeah. isn't it, in particular? Um, and you had quite an interesting story about how you, how you got into that in the first place, and I wondered if you could, you could let people know. Okay. So, I'm in, originally from Iraq, uh, lived in Baghdad, and as most of you would know, there was a lot of war there. So, when I used to be a little kid, I would always see fighter jets flying over, and... As a little kid, I'd wondered like, how these fighter jets could travel at such fast speeds and such long distances, coming from Britain, uh, America, and stuff like that. So that's what got me started into it. And then as I came to England and started studying subjects like engineering, I'd figured out that planes and my favorite subject engineering put together would be an amazing thing. And aeronautical engineering is what I hope to be doing in the future. Great, and you actually got a chance to, to kind of see the inner workings of a plane as well, didn't you? Uh, yeah, uh, I went to Jordan last Christmas and I managed to ask the captain to let me into the cockpit during a flight over the uh, Red Sea. Uh, and I got to go in and see how all the control systems worked and what different thing, how different components work and the screens and stuff like that. So that was quite cool. Superb, but I think we're meant to keep that inside the auditorium, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. okay, no one knows. Um, <laughs> and, Jacob, you can tell me a bit more about some of the work placements that you've been doing and maybe some of the Arkwright things we spoke about. Uh, well, I got the Arkwright scholarship um, last year, well, this year, just like in the beginning of the school year. Basically, you're put forward by your school, like a number of pupils. Um, you'll then, like, make an application towards it, then you'll do a test. And then you'll go to an interview. If you get through all these stages, then you get um, the scholarship itself, which basically it provides me with... Um, I have a sponsor, which is the Reese Group. So it's like Pearson Engineering and road repairs, all kinds of different things. They make armoured vehicles. So basically, I can go do work experience with them. I can like have visits to different universities through Arkwright. Like on Saturday, I went to the Natural History Museum. I was looking at um, materials through microscopes and like the structure of those materials. Yeah. So it gives you a wider understanding of the materials. It's basically, it just opens so many doors for you as in, like, wanting to do engineering. And, like, and you're helped out with this by the school? Yeah, yeah it's through, it's through um, basically, we're put forward by the school. I would know nothing about it without the school, so it's like, really useful for me. So another example of those kind of links coming yeah. into play. Super. Um, and Jake, I'm particularly keen to ask you about this, yeah. because um, uh, we were chatting earlier, and you told me that you're making bomb disposal robots. Now, the most dangerous thing I think I ever did was get lit near a rugby pitch at school, yeah. and I'm not built for it. Uh, but bomb disposal, uh, yeah. talk to me about what you're doing there. Well, basically, there's a company called Vex, and every year they put a challenge on. It's called Vex Robotics. And basically, last year we took part in this um, competition. We had to build a robot to like, move balls, lift balls, put them into different areas. And basically, with this kit, for, for now, towards our BTEC qualification, we're using this kit and what we've learned in that to bring it into our like, actual what we're doing in the lessons. So we're building a bomb disposal robot out of this kit. So we're, like, we're designing it, building it, programming it, everything, just from basically from scratch with a set list of parts. Fantastic. And you, you find that quite an engaging way to learn. It kind of, it's a real-world project, I guess. Yeah, because um, instead of just writing reports or like, what about these things, you can actually physically do these things. You, learn, you just learn so much more. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, no, please, please. 
And also, we're going to be working alongside Vex and the army, who's going to be coming in to help us and tell us about how they work on bomb disposal robots themselves and give us guidance and tips Super. for how real technologies work. So. Is there any chance your robot might get used? Uh, well, actually, last year, me and Jacob were part of a team who made a JCB robot, and that actually got sent to both Vex and JCB, and they've still got it, so Fantastic. hopefully the army well. might keep it. Lovely. Yes, I've got a, a question for picking up on um, one of the things Lord Baker was talking about, which is the decision that you four in particular had to take, because you have been at other schools before arriving now at the UTC in the studio. And, and Chloe, we're, we're hearing that you have to travel up to an hour to get there from Crosby. Why did you choose to change school? Um, um, well, in my old school, it, it was excellent. Um, but I think as someone who really loves science and gets kind of excited about it, really, um, quite often that's an odd thing. And if you express that kind of love and passion for something, you're kind of segregated. Um, and if I could have designed my own college, it would have been UTC. So I think that was, I, I'd have been silly not to have come. Um, and the only downside I could have thought of were the long days. And I think that was the only possible off-putting thing and the traveling. But I've joined and I travel for an hour a day um, and I, I wouldn't choose anything different. Um, it's worth it. And, uh, just a, a quick one to follow up on that. Uh, when you had the long day, you, you still have homework, do you? Um, not really, actually. Um, I've sort of concentrated myself on time management, so um, lots of it's hands-on work, and also any work that needs doing, I do in my freeze, so it's, mm. it's good. So it, it works in that it, sense? It, it's really functional, like a, like a normal working day, I suppose. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, who's got the microphone down there, Peter? Yeah. yeah well, what, how about you? You, you took, again, you took a decision to move to a different new type of school. Yeah, um, I was already halfway through my A-levels. I'd just finished my first year, and then I saw like the advertisements for the studio around Wirral and Liverpool. Um, and I'm from Wirral, so I just eventually, after researching into the studio, uh, decided I really liked it, and I'd like to go there, because it's specialised um, in technology and games development. And yeah, it was just, like my last school was really good, and I love this one too, just as much. And yeah, that's yeah. it really. Yeah, and, uh, either of you, you got a, anything you'd like to add about the reason you took, uh, you decided to move? Um, as for me, um, like like Chloe, I have to come an hour like every every morning, and I, I left my old school halfway through my GCSEs, pretty much like I just started them, and um, I, I made the decision because it's specialised and it's not just what everyone else is doing. It's doing you know something you enjoy rather than just the generic education that everyone else is getting. Okay. And for me, um, something that really stood out was that, um, as Lord Baker was saying, that a lot of it is based around practical work. And um, I tend to find that if you want practical work, you tend to not only learn more, but you learn, you learn faster. So over time, you, you, you see yourself learning a whole lot more than you would have if you were just, you know, just studying, like writing on paper. So. Just the fact that it's a lot of practical work, a lot of work placements that you get given, it, it really enables you to um, expand your knowledge and broaden your whole image of like what learning could lead to. And, uh, and I've got a different question for Faisal and Jacob, which is that uh, I believe that you're combining uh, BTEC engineering, is it, that you're taking BTECs yeah. with other qualifications. How does that work out and how do you feel compared with students in other schools that are doing A-levels, let's say? Uh, I'll speak first and I'll give it to Chip. For example, we do, uh, we do general engineering at our school, so that involves the mechanics, the electronics, fabrication, uh, CAD software, which is like um, computer-aided design and stuff like that. And we do a unit on each thing. It brings in physics and maths also, so it's a kind of mixed subject as well. And uh, we have eight, for double engineering, which me and Jacob do, we have eight hours a week of engineering. So, uh, for t for example, like we get two hours of fabrication, and we're working on a JCB digger arm for now. 
Uh, we're going on a school trip tomorrow also, uh, which we have a lot of opportunities to go on trips. Uh, and this JCB, we're going to look at how they make uh, the JCB and get our own ideas and uh, go back to class and hopefully improve on the robot or the arm we're doing. Basically, um, doing the BTEC, you, you will learn more from doing practical skills that I've found because although I'm learning in the other subjects, you don't have the understanding that you do by doing things yourself. Like on Monday, we went to Mini. We're looking around the factory, um, like at the production line, the assembly line. So we're looking at safety and uh, the actual manufacturing process. So we can bring that into assessments, what we're going to do in the lessons. Um, in our, in, so if we need to write like, some, like a report or something about safety, um, we can go out and look at it like ourselves. You do just get a greater understanding of what, um, what it is that you're learning about and what you need to write about. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, Claire, uh, you, you got to work at the Royal London Hospital, didn't you? Yeah. And get some kind of really hands-on experience. Yeah. And I wondered if you could kind of just explain in a bit more detail what it, what it was you did and maybe how that's made, made you think differently about what you want to do in the future or perhaps confirmed what it is you do want to do. Okay, so um, most colleges sort of... Um, um, I, I found that they think that um, the, the subjects I take, so physics, chemistry, biology, maths, are all sort of academic rather than, I think, the more vocational. And um, my college supports that and they make me the best I possibly could be. And this is by providing me with opportunities such as the Royal. Now, I got a week in the Royal, and it was invaluable. I got to try out several different areas, including uh, surgery, um, uh, research, and A&E. Um, and I think I came to the, to the college so almost naive of all the opportunities that were, were actually available to me. Um, but since being here, they've been open. I came in definitely wanting to be a GP. Um, and my eyes have been open to research. Now in my enrichment time, I've been developing things called a, um, well, developing how to make a home test kit for chlamydia and um, our own personal PCR machine. Um, all of these things are just unbelievable and just I couldn't quantify the fact I'd be doing this at my age. Um, and this all sort of is to do with the ethos of our school of supporting us and giving us those opportunities which others don't get and that's in addition of course to the core root of getting those A-levels, getting those grades but being able to turn around. Like if you look at Einstein and, and Feynman, he, they made the greatest discoveries doing menial jobs and the, the first ever scientist to synthesise a dye, he was 18. So these discoveries can come at any age but our college supports that possibility of us being the next scientists of our generation Fantastic. and they're my peers. That's great, that's inspiring. And when, when you say you got to have a go at surgery, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what exactly, what exactly <laughs> did that so look like? We, we got taught how to scrub up and how to um, deal with patients um, and sort of the kind of, the, how, how you deal with them in an emergency situation and the qualities that are needed. So it's, it's, it was really interesting. And to listen to academics like that, it's just... You, you only need one person, maybe your teachers. I mean, my teachers are so clever and they're passionate about what they do and you just need one person to inspire you and that can change your whole life in academic career. I wish I'd written that down, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> Ali, I know, because you, you, you've, you've done some kind of placement work as well, haven't you? But you've got all, you're going to, you've got a very specific idea, I yeah, think, yeah. of what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, could you, is physio work? Yeah, physio. Yeah, tell us a bit more about that, because that was interesting. Well, I mean, I haven't went to a placement so far, yeah, because the week that club we went on was to experience a different variety of um, departments there is, but because I'm more, like, I, I'm, I know what's, what I'm going to what I'm gonna go into, I will, when I, when I do start my um, placements, I'll, I'll go directly into physiotherapy, and the, the, there's already been um, people from the universities and hospitals coming in to speak to us about what they do and how they do and like how you could enter their work in the different variety of ways, so I've already spoke to them and it's, as Chloe said, I mean, it only takes like one person to really guide you in the proper way. And then from there, you start realising yourself in, in, in what you could do and how much of a broad, you know, area that you could study in that area as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and it, uh, do you think that's going to really help you shape your ideas even further about what you want to do in the future? Well, personally, personally, I... I want to study physiotherapy and 
in university, but with uh, with the whole idea of helping people, like again personally, I I want to go into um, you know I can't I don't know what, what I would label this as, but just to improve the quality of people's lives, yeah, as as a mentor, like not 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 necessarily as a doctor, but as a mentor, and just to see like what like like how, how like some people are like so happy with like so much I mean, no, no, how people are so happy with so little money because they because they just understand like what 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 makes the quality of their lives you know increase but where, where some there's some millionaires that are depressed that kill themselves so i'm into that kind of um mentoring and helping people uh, to, to improve their lives like at, at an overall base fantastic a very noble pursuit i'd say um adam and peter i wanted to ask you because you you've been designing computer games um and you've been doing that at school um but you've you've said you've Kind of that sparked your interest, and you're doing some of that outside of school as well now. I wonder if you could tell us about some of the games you're, you're designing there. Um, me, uh, along with a couple of friends that I've met by coming to the school, um, I've been making a game called Geology Rocks, and it's like um, a game where you're trapped in a mine, you have to move around blocks, you have to solve puzzles, and you have to defeat enemies in order to make your way out. Um, I actually won um, a School Enterprise Award at the International Festival of Business um, just the, the past year, and um, we won an award for the school and two hundred pounds to you know further the development of the game, and it's just been really interesting because I can use the, the skills that I've learned during school time and apply them outside of school. So, so if I wanted to play the game, could I? Is it? Is it... Um, at the moment, it's only for a limited few people. Oh, right. I mean it. If you really want to go, <laughs> based on my experience with late for a date, maybe we'll, we'll yeah. give it a miss. <laughs> um, and are, are you are you working on games as well outside of? Um, yeah, myself and my brother are both into games and technology. So we've made um, a few little games outside of school, um, and what I hope to do with them is eventually like publish them on Android and iOS. Um, so I've made about two or three ones that I hope to expand and develop over time. Um, at the moment, they're just quite small, just to test it out and see how it goes and go through the processes and to sort of establish which one I like, the, which route I like the most, be it programming or art or um, audio and whatnot. So I just think it's, it just keeps your options open. And I like, I'm finding out that I really like the art and design aspect, so I'm sort of focusing on doing the graphics for them. Um, so yeah, no, I just really like doing it. Fantastic. And I, I think I'm, I'm getting just a sense of real passion from all of you about the, the stuff you're kind of involved with, which is fantastic. Um, is that something that you, kind of, you knew you had a passion for this and then you kind of started doing it at school and you sought that out? Or, or has actually doing that in the classroom as well helped you kind of extend that passion? Or has that created the passion itself? Um, I think before I joined the school, I had a passion for things like that. But I think uh, the school's introduced a lot further the like um other things that i could do to do with um obviously digital technologies and things along those lines yeah um i'd agree with that it's like um before i came to the school i was sort of like i really like the idea the concept of designing and developing games but where to start and i think coming to the school has really helped um spark the actual ability to design and develop them and put that and then thoughts into motion. So I'm really pleased that I've came here because I think it's definitely a massive step in the right direction to a career. Superb. So, Is yeah. that kind of sentiment felt similarly um, across the board? Um, for me, um, as you said, you know, I already had the passion for doing what I want to do, but coming to an environment where its level of professionalism is so high it, it just sort of raises that standard even more, and the more you stay in that environment, the more you realise that there's more to there's more to it, and you can there's always room for improvement. You can always learn more. So, being again, as I said, being in a even though you might know what you you're, even though you might know what you want to do, surrounding yourself by the right people will always extend you know the horizon for you. Yeah, it's because when I first joined um, Archbishops. I always wanted to be an architect because I didn't really understand what engineering like could mm -hmm. be and what it was because I had like the view of what many people see it as it's just like mechanics things like that. Yeah. But through doing this course, I've I've seen that it's electrical design. Everything is in engineering. Like 
it covers like such a vast area and it's not just me mechanical things like that you can do like anything in engineering you want so I've moved away from be, like wanting to be an architect to more engineering because I've, I've always liked to design things like that so architect seemed um, what I wanted to do at, at first but now I've seen what engineering can offer I'm starting to lean more to that so it's just if you've got a good course, it will it'll inspire people to like do what they've always wanted to do, and, and like it will show people's potential through it. Yeah, fantastic. Ali, I want to pick up on something you said. You spoke about kind of contacts and making contacts. How much of an opportunity do you think you're given by the fact that you get to work with different business and companies, and you get those links through the school? It actually gives you an opportunity to make contacts out in the real world, which can be so difficult. Kind of starting to make those initial yeah. contacts and knowing who to ask the right questions and where to go. Well, that's the whole thing about um, the UCC. I mean, it's you know you're not looked at as, as a as a pupil or as a student. It's it's more about a colleague, someone that you can you know always turn to. You can no matter like whether whether it's, whether it's a friend or a teacher or the principal of this UCC, you know, you can, you can always speak to them with, with a free mind and they'll always be able to guide you because, you know, at the end of the day, they, they're there for your, for your future. So the, the, the connections that you have with UTC personally, I, I find it so different to what I've experienced before and it really does um, make that link strong, stronger with, with what you want to do in the future. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we've only got a, about a minute left for the students, so I'm, I've been hogging it a bit. David, are there any more questions well, you'd like to they, ask? Uh, uh, in that case, I'm going to ask just one impossibly difficult question. <laughs> um, we heard this morning uh, that um, over the, the, your working lives, on average, you're going to have 24 different jobs. Do you think that you're being prepared for all the jobs that are, don't even exist yet? Or are you being prepared for very specific jobs right here, right now? Okay. Should I take this one? Okay. Um, our, our college um, ensures that our, um, our, academic, our academia is also matched with what's going on with industry. So as that's evolving, as is our college. And there's, you can teach subjects, you can teach knowledge, you can't teach passion. But our college installs that. And no matter if you have 24 jobs, if you're passionate and you're interested, it doesn't matter because you enjoy what you do. So. I think that's such a brilliant answer. I don't think we should ask the others. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I, 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 because our time is up, Chris. So. It is. So um, if you could join me uh, in thanking very much the students here and wishing them the best of luck to their future. Guys, thanks very much. Keep your head down the stairs there. No worries. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much. Again, that was a pleasure interviewing you. Um, and I'd now like to invite uh, Sean, Tom and Phil, who are teachers at their schools, um, to come up to the stage and join us uh, because you're next for a grilling. <coughs> Don't worry, we'll be nice. Steve, you're welcome too. Welcome. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah possibly. Yeah, we're just fine. So, if we could, uh, if we could ask um, each of you in turn, uh, as with the students, to say who you are and where you're from. So, Phil Lloyd, I'm principal of the Life Sciences UTC in Liverpool. Um, we opened in September 2013. We're in our fourth term. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Sean McInerney. Um, I'm the principal of the studio in Liverpool, and we're co-located with the UTC. Uh, Tom Milner, I'm from Archbishop Holgate School in York, and I'm a teacher of product design and engineering. Hi, Stephen Parkinson, uh, head of engineering advanced skills teacher, Archbishop Holgate School in York. Okay, and my first question is that I'm sitting here listening to what the students are telling us about the experiences they're getting in your three different institutions. And I'm thinking, that must be incredibly complicated to organise. Is it? Shall I say Go ahead. Um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, it's actually a massive opportunity to start a school with a blank piece of paper, so you're not encumbered by the traditions and habits and expectations of the past. Um, the nine to five day that, stu that we have, Studio Schools UTCs, um, helps tremendously because the curriculum competition you get um, you know, is alleviated. 
Um, and then the complicated thing, I guess, for us is to try and match a two school timetable in one building. But we've managed it so far pretty well, actually. Yeah, I think. But uh, in, in, from a, a mainstream, if I might dare use that phrase, full 11 to 18 academy, you seem to have got some very good links with companies from well beyond the confines of York. How did you manage that? Well, I think it's about, it's that extra thing a teacher needs to do. I think teaching and learning within a school is obviously incredibly important. There's a huge focus on that. But for me as an engineering teacher, from the head of the department, it's about getting in touch with these companies, about making phone calls, about sending emails. It's about getting the getting industry into school, but also it's about making the opportunity so pupils can, can visit the school, so visit industry as well. And although, yeah, it's extra work, I wouldn't say it was difficult at all. And I'd say that it was one of the most important things for me as a teacher to seriously enhance the learning opportunities of young people. Mm, yeah, because in just this one week, you've had the visit to Mini on Monday and it's JCB tomorrow. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, Min Mini this week looking at production lines on Monday. Tomorrow we're looking at fabrication. Each one of those visits is linked to a particular unit of the BTEC Engineering Level 3 in school. So everything is linked uh, as practically as possible. Everything is applied. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we were in Munich. We took the pupils to see the BMW factory, the Audi factory, the Allianz Arena. Uh, and the 1972 Olympic Park. So we're giving them as many opportunities as we can. We're giving them as broad an experience of engineering as possible. Um, and what we're finding is actually pupils are coming in thinking that they want to be a specific engineer in a specific sector, but then actually going off in a different direction altogether as well. Yeah, Tom wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think it's also important that the, um, the school and the head teacher and Steve, the head of department, gives us opportunities to go out there and find the links industry. So like today, we're off timetable, like Monday, we're off timetable on Friday, going out and creating the links so that we can bring them into schools to enhance the learning of the students. I think that's really important. Yeah, and, and, and Phil, you've also got, in addition to your employer links, a very, very clear and strong link with the university. Very much. I'd just like to reiterate what's just been said, actually, in terms of the time and the resource in maintaining and establishing those links. So Sean and I both employ directors of enterprise who are industry specialists who come in and focus on managing those specifically for us and creating the opportunities for the students. We're sponsored by the University of Liverpool. The University of Liverpool have invested a huge amount of time, expertise, support um, in terms of both promoting their courses, promoting their own institution, but also opening students' eyes in terms of the variety of opportunities that are out there for them. So yeah, very, very positive relationships with the university. We're lucky in Liverpool, we've got four, um, but the University of Liverpool are leading the way from our point of view. And uh, I, I also wanted to um, ask you how you would respond to the last question I was, I was putting, and Chloe gave us such a brilliant answer, um, you're all on the spot now. Some might think that the specialisms that you're offering might narrow opportunities. How would you respond to that? It's interesting working with our industry partners, particularly in the context of life sciences. So um, the life sciences specialists present students with a list of 200 jobs and ask which ones of those are involved in the sector. And the reality is all of them, some of the big shortages are around lawyers, accountants, um, HR expert, uh, business experts in life sciences, but they all value that little bit of experience and opportunity in the um, sector that's relevant, or the science that's relevant to their own um, employment area. Um, I think the, um, uh, the chances that students get to work with employers are incredibly important. It gives the employers a link of, or a view of where students are coming from. They're driving our curriculum, so as Chloe said, the curriculum continues to evolve based on what employers are telling us they want us to do. From our point of view, I was interested in the debate earlier on around vocational academic qualifications and um, education. For us, it's all about the vocational education, and whether that's A-level physics, chemistry, biology, or maths, it's all about the next steps for students. So we underpin everything we do with a promise to students that will give them a positive next step, be it an apprenticeship, an employment opportunity, or a higher education place. And that's underpinned by the qualifications that they do, but then the wider curriculum. The wider curriculum has been fascinating because we've taken out qualification frameworks from our project-based learning and that's just been about pushing the boundaries and again the university have been involved in that and they describe the technical skills of students as hitting second year undergraduate third year undergraduate or even postgraduate level in some cases it's challenging where some of our university partners are in terms of the curriculum that they offer for first year undergraduate courses and um, we've got universities talking about taking students into the second year of their courses um, and so it's it's challenging the boundaries really mm. 
And, and, and Sean, next, um, and how do you view this? Are you preparing for the jobs that don't exist yet? I think it's about um, preparing for complexity, isn't it? Um, I was struck by what Charles Ledbeck was saying this morning, you know, about um, the, having the agility of mind, really, uh, to deal with any situation and how, as, as, as we answer that challenge as educators, to provide a curriculum that, that gives young people that. Um, within the studio schools model, the project-based learning comes with, you know, not a, um, an adherence to a certain pedagogy, but with, a, with an expectation that you put your pedagogy in place there. And it blows open um, the normal pedagogy that, you're, that, that you can experiment with in a, in a conventional assessed curriculum. Um, when we were designing that, we turned to our industry specialists, who are now actually our board of, go uh, board of governors, and we said, how do we and develop a, a curriculum in project-based learning that replicates the experience of asset generation and, and, and games creation um, that you actually use in the digital and creative sectors. So um, we have um, a set of project outcomes and a way of doing things that mirrors the industry. So when our industry mentors come in, they're sharing the language of industry and also training them in, in industry-specific techniques. So. Um, Adam would tell you how he uses Trello, for example, um, to project manage, manage his team to make sure that they're hitting their deadlines for the games that they're creating. Um, the students have all had a workshop from Sony um, to create X statements. You know, how do you take a complex set of ideas and um, um, ideas generation? How do you boilerplate that and reduce it down to a very clear statements that could go on the front of a, um, a, of a piece of packaging. You know, how do you create your elevator pitch that's going to get that funded? And pulling in partners to give, which are really kind of corporate professional training sessions uh, to our students, I think has an employability element, but it also has a professionalism element. And it also has an expectation that the students are thinking about the next steps, as Phil was saying. So it's not just about now, it's how am I going to use this? And in what circumstances are these skills going to be transferable? And, and to be the uh, entrepreneurs of the future. Absolutely, the, yeah, the entrepreneurs and the intrapreneurs of the future as well, I think. Um, I mean, my partners t say to me the first question, that um, they ask an interview is tell me about something you've learned that hasn't been taught to you. Now that's given us a massive impetus to promote a real culture of independent learning. And our students will say that what they appreciate most, I think, well, one of the things they appreciate most is being able to um, be trusted to learn themselves and to be given the scaffolding to do that. Mm -hmm. And if we can crack that, we're not there yet, but if we can crack that, then I think we'll be doing what all schools are trying to aspire to. Let's make, you know, make our young people responsible for their own progress, which would be great. Yeah, now, the Archbishop Holgate School didn't used to have a sixth form. Uh, is it about six or seven years you've had a sixth form now? So you will have had leavers. Um, and uh, what sort of destinations do you have from these uh, kind of technical and academic programs combined? Yeah, so we're slightly different in that we're an 11 to 18 uh, year old school. And um, we started our sixth form six years ago with a specific intention of it to be purely vocational sixth form and applied learning. Uh, our, so far, 100% of our students have gone into further and higher education, whether that be apprenticeships, which tend to be about 50%, or whether they go on to university to continue their studies, which tends to be 50%. So we don't specifically uh, insist on one route or the other. Uh, we, keep it, we, we allow students to keep it as an open mind as possible. And students are sometimes not making that decision until they get the results. Uh, but the majority of them now are the sort of halfway through year 12. They're, they're looking at where they're going to go next. And not always is university the best place for these pupils to go. In fact, most recently, one pupil has just gone off in to do an apprenticeship for, for Haida. Um, and that's led him to then uh, earn himself a degree, uh, which again, as Lord Becker was saying earlier, it's cost him absolutely nothing, but the benefit for the company is that they've got an apprentice uh, who's qualified at the standard they want with the skill set that, that they want. So it's, it's a great opportunity for them there. Chris, have you got a question? Yeah, the, the question that's kind of been going around in my mind, is especially um, for the schools working nine to five, obviously nine to five is a very long day for the students, um, but that invariably means an even longer day for teachers. Um, how did, is that 
Is that something that is embraced, or how is that dealt with? Um, we adhere to school teachers' paying conditions. <laughs> Uh, we, 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 we have relatively low teaching loads compared to many schools in terms of a percentage teaching load, but actually hours contact time, they're probably um, substantially higher than they would be normally. Um, you heard Chloe talk about earlier not taking a great deal of homework home, so we do create the opportunity for students to do as much as they can while they're in school. So we make use of the nine to five day. Interestingly, we um, asked parents really how recently how they feel about that. And um, they were incredibly positive about it. And many described things like their family life improving because they didn't need to spend their evenings chasing kids upstairs to complete their homework. Most of the work that they do is done during the time they're with us. Um, teachers buy into a particular model. And uh, my view of um, education and teachers is it's a wonderful landscape where you can choose an environment that suits you. And the teachers we select or we recruit, we've done very well in terms of recruitment over the first two years. I've got a fantastic team, and I think Sean would um, mirror that. Um, but as part of that recruitment process, we talk very carefully to the teachers about um, uh, what it is they're buying into, what they're committing mm -hmm. to, and how that will impact on their working lives and the opportunities that are there. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, I think I'd reiterate the, the importance of the model. And um, you know, we don't get masses of applications for jobs, but we always get people who are passionately connect with what we're about. And we're very explicit, actually, about what we need. Um, and you know the relationships are really important in a small school and it's a small school model coaching is a culture and an ethos and you know we're doing things in a progressive way in many you know in, in many ways and um, and teachers connect with that and some of them come to us you know and take drops in salary so they can be part of it which is yeah. incredible actually should we see if there are any questions from the audience uh, it might be quite difficult for us to see hands but I can see one over there right in the middle um, now, I'm not, uh, because we didn't really prepare this, there may not be a roving mic. You might just have to shout. Oh, I just want to make a comment that it's a little bit frustrating that there's absolutely not one woman on. Yeah. 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 I, funnily enough, I was going to ask that myself. Um, But it's a very good point, and I was going to ask about this, because uh, the, 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 certainly the, the UTC uh, is slightly more girls than boys, I believe. But let, let's go through this. I agree entirely, and it's something we picked up. Um, I um, spoke to Chloe about it earlier on as the um, representative of our student body, um, along with Ali. Um, we're 63% girls in the school. Um, the... the um, um, Staff cohort is 50-50, actually. I think it's 53% um, female, um, equal across the senior management team. So actually, in terms of the school environment, I think there's very positive um, role models, very positive environment. Actually, in terms of life sciences, we're not doing anything special in that respect. It actually reflects the sector we're working in. So. Okay, well, the, the, speaking for the Edge Foundation, <laughs> uh, I agree with you entirely. And uh, the, the, there is a, a very important point about um, the, the, the gender issues and uh, for some areas where uh, the, there is a dominance of one gender or another. And in fact, had you not asked that, I was certainly going to ask the question about uh, the gender balance in engineering specifically and what more can be done to encourage girls to take that on. And you might want to answer the point about the gender balance in staff as well, if you want to. Yeah, obviously, um, there's two male teachers here from Archbishop Holgate School Engineering Department. Um, actually, there's two female engineering teachers from our department who, aren't here, who are not here today. I think it's not... No. <laughs> well, um, I think there's no, there's no secret that there's a a problem nationally with recruiting females uh, into engineering, uh, particularly in engineering education. I think the main thing that we got right first was getting a broad and balanced engineering curriculum, getting the right course, which was linked as closely as possible to what was happening in industry. Uh, and now we are seeing an increase in, in females coming into engineering. So for example, uh, being the most popular option subject in the school, 
We've got 60 students, and this year we've got eight, eight female students come through. <laughs> Next year, we've got 20 level three female students coming onto the course. So we are seeing an increase in females coming through there. And I think speaking to, to young, uh, young females about engineering, they don't know what engineering is. So as a job as me as a teacher, I need to let them know what engineering is. And also, unfortunately, they feel that engineering isn't for them because of the stigma attached to it. Okay, and uh, we're doing an awful lot to get females into engineering in our school. And I think for us, which is different to the other gentlemen here, we can do an awful lot at Key Stage 3. So we're doing things at Key Stage 3 like building robotics, uh, like getting industry in. Uh, and both male and females, they've got the opportunities to then, to then move forward with it. But in turn, back to the original um, question, we are seeing a significant increase in females coming through. Yes. Um, I'll just add to that, um, you know, we're hampered by, by the sectors that we serve in some ways and, you know, I'm told by my governing body that we do a better job than them in attracting um, female students. We're about 80-20 and what we do is um, we have month, we, we're trying to work with them to get more female students and to get more female students interested in, in computing and coding. So we do monthly events. Um, with our partners for the external um, sort of Liverpool young people uh, come in specifically focused on attracting female coders in particular and so uh, and we keep plugging away and we keep plugging away and um, and and we are making inroads we are getting more applications from female students and we have we're very conscious about the role models we have around school so most of the leaders in school are female um, we have, we've consciously recruited a, a coding champion who's a recent uh, graduate, again, um, a female student. But it ain't easy um, to, to tip that balance because it's a wider societal problem, it's a wider industry problem, and we're doing what we can. Yeah, and I, I, I take entirely your point about um, uh, our role as organisers, that um, we should have looked at the, that, uh, the list in advance and thought uh, we should have done something about it. So uh, take that as an apology from me. Are there any qu other questions, quickly, from the... Yes, I see one over there. Hi there. Uh, when you uh, offer your workshops and masterclasses from your industry experts, do you invite other local schools in? Yes. Yes and yes. Um, we've had primary schools in coming and doing science specialist workshops. Secondary schools, we have some very good partnerships with a small number of secondary schools. As with all new schools in any area, the um, uh, relationships are building, I think it would be fair to say. Um, there are secondary vacancy, or vacant secondary places in Liverpool. Um, I wasn't the most popular person when I arrived in Liverpool. Um, that's building over time. Um, certainly schools are welcome to come and experience it. Students are welcome to come in and join us. And actually, one of the reasons we're there, and it comes back to a question that was asked earlier about how do um, schools work more with industry. Our partners um, tell us regularly that over many, a long period of time they've struggled to work with education in the way that they'd like to. And it's very much about the investment in time and resource in managing those relationships. And what they see is the development of the UTC as developing a model that they're comfortable working with, but they very much see that as then a model that broadens out and is shared with a wider education community and shared with a, a larger number of schools over time. But as I go back to what I said originally, we're in term four, so this is very much work in progress. Um, and, and you have masterclasses as well, do we you have, Yeah, we have masterclasses internally, but um, externally we do. On the half terms, holiday time, we um, ha have our partners delivering workshops um, across the same model that we use in project-based learning, um, but to students from ages like 12 to 18 from a whole range of other schools. And I think, you know, maybe two to 300 students went through that last year. Yeah. Uh, now, your circumstances are different, but um, the, the, there is a history of good working with uh, the secondary schools across York. Uh, is there any element of cross-fertilisation? Yeah, well, like most cities, we've got a, we've got a network uh, at a teacher level. But um, in terms of work with primaries, we take pupils from 36 primary schools in the city, and we offer workshops and we offer uh, learning opportunities for students and for teachers also. So one of the one of the big things we find in engineering is, and primary school teachers find in particular, is how do they deliver design and technology and engineering successfully in primary schools so that the transition from primary school into secondary school, particularly our secondary school, which specialises in engineering, 
is as smooth as possible. Um, so yeah, we, we do do an awful lot of work then. I do think that it's incredibly important as well. And from a parental point of view, from parents at primary school, they obviously then go home and they see what's happening at our school and that helps them to make the decision as well. But while we're on um, you know, parents at primary schools and going back to the point about, about females, one of, the, one of the big problems we get as well, unfortunately, is parents talking their students sorry, it's talking their, their children who are females out of engineering because they don't believe it to be uh, a, a job or a career for young, for, for young female people, fortunately. And that's something that we have to compete with as well. Yes. Well, I fear that we've run out of time for this part of the session. Um, the, the, the gender issue is undoubtedly a very important one, which um, uh, on another day perhaps we could have a further conversation about. Um, only 7% of engineering apprenticeships are taken by young women, and uh, that compares with 30% in some other European countries, which is still not 50%, but it means there's a long way for us to go before we get that balance right. And yes, uh, we should be exemplifying that on stage too, so that is a point well made. But I think from what we've heard from the students, but also from um, the staff who've joined us on stage, is that uh, they are embarked on a very interesting journey in terms of creating a different form of curriculum which does not lose the importance of academic rigour for one moment. Um, and I think we're going to see the results um, when we look at the exam results for these six students, but more widely, that we're going to see some very impressive um, results and that we can expect to see some of them being our future leaders, future doctors, engineers, entrepreneurs <laughs> in years to come. So thank you very much for coming and talking to us today about the work that you're all doing. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I'd just like to echo on, on behalf of myself and SAT, uh, we completely agree with that, the point that you made um, and we should have looked at that. But hopefully you can see that there are some institutions there who are doing some really great things to encourage women into that kind of sector. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, David um, to speak. We've had a look at some, some domestic examples uh, of schools doing some things here, uh, working with the intelligent hand. I'd like to invite David, who's been on trips around the world, to uh, tell us about what he's learned and give us an international perspective on the intelligent hand. David. Yes, thank you very much. Well, uh, working for the Edge Foundation, which um, was set up 10 years ago after the sale of Edexcel to Pearson, um, Edge, Edge's whole mission is about understanding the world of technical, practical and vocational learning and um, generating good practice here in England and across the uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. But when we looked at this, I was very interested to see, first of all, the comparisons that politicians typically make with the German-speaking world. And that's very important, and I will be coming back to that. But when you look at some of the systems that there are in the German-speaking world, such as uh, selection at 10 or 11 in Germany into different types of school, I don't think there would be much of an appetite for that. Lord Baker, you will have heard, um, fervently believes that transfer at 14 would be the right age and um, he, he's actually campaigning actively and then investing through his UTC movement um, in that very concept. But I was very interested to see what the rest of the English speaking world does about it where we have perhaps to some extent cultural as well as linguistic things in common. And so over a period of time not all at once, I have actually had the benefit of going to look at some examples. Here's one that actually, again, Lord Baker mentioned earlier. Uh, this is the Academy for Software Engineering in Manhattan, um, and it is in a building that previously housed a high school of 2,500 students, um, and they now occupy one small part of it because there are only 600 students in this academy. Um, it's not an easy area of New York by any means, and they have full body metal detectors and x-ray machines for the students, and they have a permanent police presence. Um, now that shows you that it's a fairly challenging environment. Um, but young people like this are learning to use coding and software now from the age of 14, but working with people from Google, Microsoft, 
uh, LinkedIn, other ma major names that you would recognize who have an important presence in New York. And it is helping them to achieve the academic standards required for high school graduation and a indus an industry recognized credential. There aren't very many of them. And it's certainly true that and quite a number of the larger high schools are being closed, but that's not to say that this is very widespread in New York yet, but it's a very interesting development that actually runs parallel to the kind of movement that Lord Baker has been spearheading. Out in the state of New York, um, this is perhaps slightly more conventional in a sense, but there is a shared vocational facility um, across a, a wide county area. Um, this is Yorktown Heights. And students come to spend time, typically half a day or a day a week, in this centre. It would be the equivalent of going to an FE college, except this is not a community college. It is a facility that is shared by the schools in the area. Uh, this is a, actually a mobile unit which is used for taster classes for middle school students to find out about different aspects of what it means to create and manage a building. So it's more than architectural design. It's more than simply putting wires into a house or, or, or pipe work. It's looking at things like green energy and um, ground source heat pumps and showing that actually uh, this is not just, construction is not just about bricklaying. Um, and this en encourages students to think that whilst they're at their high schools, they perhaps would like to spend some time um, at the vocational centre. Elsewhere in the United States, um, this is Nashville. Um, and uh, this is what one of the students at um, McGavock High School said. In Nashville, they have 12 so-called zoned high schools, in other words, comprehensive high schools, zone meaning that if you live within a particular catchment area, the assumption is you're going to go to that zoned high school. Now, those 12 collectively uh, were performing extremely badly for many years, and Nashville was bouncing along the bottom of any national league tables of academic achievement that you like, might care to mention. To cut a, what is a long story short, um, about a decade ago, they started work on transforming the entire 12 zoned high schools into um, small learning communities, which they would call uh, academies. We might call them studio schools, uh, career academies. Uh, but the, there is a common theme. When they first start at high school, there is a freshman academy that happens across all of the 12 zoned high schools where there is a lot of intensive career education, including a major careers fair for that age group. But they're learning about the different careers that are available in the wider Nashville catchment area. And then from that, they choose a themed academy, which could be uh, the Academy of Aviation and Transportation, or it could be an Academy of Health and Care. Um, and they are learning in many of the same ways that we've heard from uh, our students just now. Um, but every single student does this across the entire city. So with 12 high schools, there's more than 40 themed academies, only one of which is not directly connected with the economy, and that's the International Baccalaureate Academy. Um, but it means that a student who perhaps is in hopeful of going to a, an Ivy League university and being a doctor in the future will benefit from being in the themed academy through the connections they make with the hospital in the same way that we hear about the um, uh, life sciences UTC in Liverpool. Vancouver, British Columbia. Well, uh, uh, it, it, we heard about British Columbia this morning. Um, and uh, they have devised a high school programme uh, which is across, uh, goes across the, the final years of high school through to age 18. So it's a pathway of accumulating credits that count towards the final high school diploma. And there is an expectation that four of the credits will be in an applied or creative subject. The intention being, again, that there is less of a segregation between the academic high flyers who do purely academic subjects and those who are less able to do the academic subjects being shepherded towards the vocational workshops. I will say that in practice, 
they are still on that journey and there is still a divide and one of the interesting things that the research tells us is that when you interview people a few years after they've left high schools in uh, British Columbia, the academic high flyers look back and wish they had done more practical hands-on learning while they had the chance. And um, Vancouver, British Columbia as a whole, um, has a similar problem to the graduate uh, oversupply or underemployment, depending on which way you look at it, uh, to the one that Lord Baker was talking about earlier. But certainly they have some fantastic facilities. And that um, young lady working in the kitchen, they supply, uh, they, they cook all the school meals, but they also have outside catering contracts. And she was preparing um, a, an order for a local company um, the, the day that I went. Um, that uh, enormous workshop, you can make anything you like in wood, up to and including boats. In Auckland, They've only recently started on vocational pathways. They, they have adopted six broad vocational pathways, the idea being that it is not about narrow trades training. It is about understanding a broad sector so that if, if they are working in the engineering field, they will find out about civil and uh, chemical and mechanical and electrical. They, they, they will understand that engineering is a very broad field. Um, having said that, there is an element called uh, trades academies which is very much focused on a, the, that segment of the youth population that's really pretty disengaged and this, this particular illustration is from one of those um, in West Auckland where the students are actually constructing this house. A lot of New Zealand houses are is built in one place and then transported to the final site. And so they are actually learning the skills are required to, be, to work in construction. And what they've found is that by providing it within the school setting, they are getting attendance rates very much higher than they used to. And there is a better engagement with the core subjects, particularly English and maths. Um, but I did want to come back to Switzerland uh, simply because I still think that despite the different cultures there are things we can learn from them and the, it's really important to confront this point that two thirds of people who move on into upper secondary, at the, in their case they move on at the age of 15, not 16, they choose apprenticeships and that means it's a middle class option which, if we're honest, it isn't in England at the moment, not to any great extent. But Switzerland, it is perfectly normal. And one of the key reasons is the progress that they then make afterwards. Now, this, this, this happens to illustrate a, a, a culinary, culinary apprenticeship programme where they're learning here, um, in the English language, actually, uh, it, it, you won't see it from the, uh, the, the, the picture, but what they've got in front of them is a, a set of phrases and words so that if they moved on to have a job in the English-speaking world, they would be able to order kitchen supplies and raw ingredients. Um, and here at the NOR factory where they make dried soup mixes, that's a 15-year-old apprentice on the right telling us in English about the process line that he is learning to supervise. But the point I want to make is that they're building in expectations. So they expect that if you're doing the chef apprenticeship programme, you are going to go and work overseas at some point. And with the Nor factory, I also met someone who is 30, who had started his apprenticeship at 15, um, had subsequently had an opportunity to work in Venezuela for another Unilever subsidiary. When he came back to the same factory here, um, he did, was sponsored to do a degree at a University of Applied Science part-time and now he's a um, director of a Unilever subsidiary that imports fair trade and organic ingredients from around the world and he's being sponsored to do a master's level qualification in quality systems. So the Swiss have built in the expectation that if you start an apprenticeship at 15 you are going to progress all the way through as far as you want to go. And that could mean geographically wherever you want to go, but certainly academically it means to degree level and beyond. Now, we are not instantly going to get to the point of having two-thirds of 15-year-olds starting apprenticeships, 
but it certainly makes you think about how we try to create better pathways through um, that, uh, that say we must increasingly challenge the idea that you do your A-levels at 18, then you go to university, then you get a job. There are these many pathways to success, and that's really part of the EDGE mission and why we wanted to be involved in the um, programme this afternoon to share some of the ideas and the experiences of the students themselves. Um, and I just felt that uh, in a session like this and a conference like this, which has a very international outlook, to share some of those experiences from around the world would provoke some thought. There isn't time for the debate right now, but I hope that we've given you in this session uh, some interesting ideas that you might be able to debate and develop um, later on. Thank you very much indeed.